Now, as you are able, would you please stand for the reading of the word, which today is going to be done by one of our high school students, Matt. I'm going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when called to the when called to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. I'm going to be reading from Genesis 12, um, 1 through 8. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old and set out for Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and all the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. And they arrived there, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Merai at Shechem. At the time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will bless you and give this land I mean, I will, so, sorry, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the east and Ai on the, on the east, on the west. There, um, there he, uh, then Abram set out, oh, so, sorry. Um, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. may be seated. Well, good morning. good morning. It's good to be with you here. My name is Ryan. For those of you that I may not know, I'm on staff here. And it's a joy to come together on this day where we get to celebrate our students, our kids, and just to celebrate what God is doing in reaching the next generation and using our church to continue to move the gospel forward. By the way, I got to spend part of this weekend with our, our fourth and fifth graders who are at Wolf Mountain. There's about 30 of them hanging out at Wolf Mountain, worshiping God, praising God, going crazy for God. Uh, they were running through the rain all day yesterday and having all sorts of fun in the rain, you know. Um, it, we didn't know it was gonna rain, but God did, and uh, he had a plan for it anyways. And so it's just been a, a really fun time this weekend of, of celebrating our youth and students and kids and, and this next generation. And so we're grateful that all of you are here. By the way, where are my first through fifth graders at? First through fifth graders, again, there's a few of you here in the room. Where are the middle schoolers at? Middle schoolers, we got some middle schoolers in the room today. Yep, a bunch of you kind of spread out. High schoolers, high schoolers in the room. There you go, making some noise, good. Where are those who normally attend the 1045 service? Still wasn't as loud as the high schoolers, even though there's a lot more of you, that's okay. Uh, what about those who normally attend the traditional service? Did I just get a roll tide on the traditional service? <laughs> All right, well, we are excited that all of you are here and join us together. What a joy it is to come together as the church and just to worship God in unison. And so we are continuing our series talking about our big God. And we're in a series called Big God. We're talking about having big faith in a big God. And we talked the very first week about how faith the size of a mustard seed, which is just this tiny little seed placed in Christ, can move mountains. And we wanna be mountain movers in our world. And so we need faith placed in Jesus and to trust him completely. That's what faith is and let our lives follow along. And we've been looking through Hebrews 11 and looking at some pretty incredible faith journeys and faith stories in Hebrews 11. And uh, week one, or sorry, I guess it was week two, we talked about how Abel was faith worshiping. Abel in faith worshiped God by making a sacrifice saying, hey, there's something that is important to me, but not as important as God is. 
So he gave his his time, his treasure, his talent before God to worship God with all that he had. And then we saw that Enoch was faith walking. Enoch walked faithfully with God, agreeing to the place on the path and going the same pace as God, walking with him in relationship with him, which is what the Christian life is all about. And then last week, Blake so masterfully took us through uh, Noah's story and talked about faith working and how Noah actually did something for God and faith without actions is dead. So we're saved by faith alone, but not a faith that is alone. Faith is gonna lead to some action. It's gonna lead to some work because this world needs some kingdom builders in it. And the verses that Matt just read for us talk about Abraham and his faith. And Abraham is gonna demonstrate to us a faith that is willing, a faith that is willing. Honestly, it's a faith that is willing to work. It's a faith that is willing to walk. It's a faith that is willing to worship. And more specifically, it's a faith that is willing to go. And so we're gonna be looking at Abraham's story. So Abraham had faith, uh, a willingness that was demonstrated in three ways. And I'm gonna mention them for you and then we'll break them down. Abraham was willing to go. He was willing to forego. And he was willing to worship and to witness. For those of you taking notes, if you can't keep up, that's okay. We're going to come back to all three of these. So let's start with number one. Abraham was willing to go where God called him to go without all the knowledge of where he was supposed to be. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. See, this was an act of trust. He didn't know the land of Canaan was gonna be the land that God had given to them until he arrived there. God said to go and he got up and he went. Now it's easy to go with someone. It's easy to go somewhere if someone tells us where we're going and we can be prepared for it. Listen, no matter where I'm going, when I go on trips, I always begin to stress out a little bit because there's a part of me that begins to get nervous that I'm not gonna be fully prepared, that I'm not gonna have all the things that I need and what if I forgot something and what if I'm not ready and what if the weather changes and, 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 and you know, all these different things. Now imagine that, but you don't even know the climate, you don't know the people, you don't know the weather, you don't know any of that information. Are you willing to go? Well, Abraham was willing to go where God called him to go and the question is, why? Why was he able to place his faith in this moment to faithfully go, not knowing the location that he would end up? Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 12 to get some context. And if you're flipping through your own Bible, just make sure you keep a marker there in Hebrews 11, because we're going to go back and forth between Genesis 12 and Hebrews 11. Tells in Genesis 12, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country and your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran and took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot and all the possessions that accumulated and the people that acquired in Haran and they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. So we look at this text and you ask the question, why was Abraham willing to go? By the way, if you're not familiar, Abram and Abraham are the same person. God eventually changes his name and adds a couple letters in there for you. So I'm gonna be saying Abraham because that's just more what I'm familiar with. But the text is Abram, just so there's there's clarity there. Um, So why was Abraham willing to do this? Well, it's clear that he knew God. It's clear that he knew God because when God spoke, Abraham knew who it was. He didn't need convincing Abraham, this is God. Who's that? I'm the creator of all things. I gave you life. Mm, How do I know? Right? Abraham knew God. And then God reveals his promises to Abraham. Five times in a span of two verses, we see God say, Abraham, I will do this for you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. Five times God says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And he's making this promise to Abraham that, hey, yes, you need to go somewhere, but you know what? I'm taking care of all the hard stuff. I got you. You're in my care. You're in my hands. And I'm gonna lead the way. 
So you don't need to trust the destination. You don't need to trust the fact. You just need to trust me. And if you're willing to go where I'm calling you to go, I will get you there. Now, God has called each and every one of us to some things. And there, there's some things we've talked about in general. And we talk about this a lot. What does God call us to in general? Well, first, he calls us to love him with all our hearts, minds, soul, and strength. Everything that we have should be directed towards God. Are you willing to go to this place where you're saying, God, I'm pursuing you and I'm pursuing relationship with you and I just wanna love you and give you all of myself. He says the second greatest commandment is like the first. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. It flows from that first one. If you love God, you'll begin to love others. You'll begin to love his image bearers. And if you can't love his image bearers, you're gonna have a hard time loving the one whose image they represent. And so these two things are interconnected. That if we love God, we're gonna love others. Are you willing to love others? By the way, that idea of your neighbor, Jesus clarifies, this is not just the people that you get along with. It's not just the people who buy you things, right? It's not just people who think like you and act like you. This is everyone who you come in contact with is your neighbor. There's some challenging people who are your neighbor. There's some people you disagree with who are your neighbor. There's some people who are a little strange to you that are your neighbor. There's people that don't look like you, don't sound like you, don't talk like you, don't act like you, who are your neighbor. And are you willing to go to a place of demonstrating the love of Christ towards these people in the way that Jesus has called us to do? And the third thing we talk about is the great commission that we are sent people to go and make disciples. The work of discipleship, it starts at the point of meeting with those who are exploring the faith, are not interested in the faith and walking in life with them, demonstrating gospel love so that we can present the gospel to them so that they can receive Christ. And then we take those who have put their trust in Christ and we continue to disciple them until the point where they're making disciples. The goal is ultimately to be a church filled with people who make disciples who make disciples. That's what we've been sent to do. Are you willing to go where God has called you to go? Now, all of that's gonna play itself out in in different ways for each different person. You might go out to lunch today and you might see someone sitting by themselves and they just look like they're going through something. You might feel that stirring from God to say, hey, go and talk to that person. There might be someone who's really difficult that you encounter out in the world today and, and, and you just want to scream and yell and fight with them like you see everyone else do, but something stirs in your heart that says, no, 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 you need to express grace and forgiveness, demonstrate love to this person. Are you willing to go where God has called you to go? And we might not have all the answers. We might not know how it's gonna work out. We might not be able to see the end, but do you trust God enough to get you there? See, maybe if we're not trusting God, we're not doing the things that God has called us to do, maybe we don't know him well enough. And if that's the case, we need to spend some time with him in prayer and get into his word and make sure that we know the voice of God and we know the heart of God. The other thing though, is that maybe you know God, but you don't know God's promises. And so when he calls you to go somewhere that you're not familiar with, somewhere where there's Uh, some question marks. You're thinking, I got to do this on my own. This is going to be hard and challenging and it's going to overwhelm me and it's going to crush me and defeat me. Let me share a couple of promises I found. I just started looking up promises of God and looking through scripture, trying to find some and there's way too many to put on one slide. So these are the ones you get. Here's some promises that God gives to us in scripture. God will never leave you. God is a refuge for us. God cares for you. God answers prayers. In other words, you're not on your own. God will give you rest. So when you think it's overwhelming, trust in God to be your rest. Jesus is always with us. God offers eternal life. So we have something to look forward to. God's love cannot be taken away and God will meet your needs. And so when we start making it all about us and thinking, I can't do this because I don't have the resources, I don't have the intelligence, I don't have the money, I don't have whatever it is to go and live out this vision that God is putting on my heart. We remember these promises, God will meet our needs. And I can talk to him in prayer and he'll respond. It's not always gonna say yes, by the way, but he's always gonna give an answer. And remember, and I'm never alone in this. God is with me, he's got me through all of this. So if we know the promises of God and we know the heart of God and we know who he is, maybe we'll be willing to go even when he doesn't give us all the information of where we're headed. 
But we know the call on our life, love God, love others, make disciples. And we need a church of people who's willing to do that. Because there's a world filled with people who don't know Jesus and don't have hope and don't have peace and don't have eternal security. And we have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Are you willing to go? Now, if you go where God calls you to go, you're also gonna have to let go of some things. And Abraham was willing to forego. He was willing to leave some things behind, to let go of some things so that he could live into the promise that God had in store for them. And it tells us in Hebrews 11, verse nine, it says, by faith, he, Abraham, made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Abraham did this hard thing and it was hard to go to this place, but it was also hard to leave things behind. I mean, you look and it says that he left his home. We see he left his identity by becoming a stranger. He left his culture by going to a foreign country. He left his house and lived in a tent. This is the point of God's call where I'm like, God, send somebody else. Like I'm willing to go, but I'm gonna need a hotel or maybe an Airbnb. I'm not picky. I just need a king size bed with nice sheets. That's all. <laughs> Abraham left some things behind. Following God and going where he wanted him to go, it cost him something. But he was willing to do this because he was looking forward to the promise to the city whose architect and builder was God himself. And he says, God's gonna take me somewhere better. Now, here's the thing. Abraham didn't even see the, full, the complete fulfillment of what God had promised to him. That doesn't happen for many generations. But Abraham was faithful and looking forward to God's promise and looking forward to the hope that he had in, in God, he did what he needed to do and left some things behind. Many of us, we try and hold on to all the things of this world and we try and cling to the things, to, to comfort, to possessions, to money, to finances, to security, all these things we think that the world can offer to us. And there's many times where God's saying, hey, you're gonna have to leave some of that behind to step into the promise that I have for you. We need to keep our eyes focused on eternity, on the eternal city where the architect and builder is God and he is the one who's gonna welcome us into a place where there's no tears or sorrow or pain or hurt or death or disease. And we just rejoice in the presence of God forever. But sometimes that's gonna mean letting go of some things that are here and now. There was a time where Jesus was talking about this very idea. And in the gospel of Mark, Peter speaks up in Mark 10, 28, it says, Peter spoke up and he says, we have left everything to follow you. And Jesus responds by saying this, says, truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, along with persecutions, just that extra reminder that things are still gonna be difficult, right? And that we don't get everything we want. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Jesus is telling Peter and his disciples and us here 2,000 years later, stop trying to build your kingdom here. Stop trying to store up treasures here where moth and rust destroy. But instead, store up treasures in heaven. Because if all we do is focus our time and attention on building things here and getting things here, we might be foregoing the treasures that we can have for eternity. And listen, no matter how long you live on this earth, it's a dot in the line of eternity. It's like nothing in the line of eternity. So don't cling too tightly to the things of this world that are here today and gone tomorrow but cling tightly to Jesus, to who he is, to his promises, to his truth, and to the eternal life we'll have with him if we've put our trust in him. That's what we need to cling to. That's what we need to hold on to. That's what we need to keep our eyes focused on. And it might just help us go where God has called us to go, leaving some things behind, trusting in him. 
So Abraham was willing to go, he was willing to forego, and finally he was willing to worship and to witness. He was willing to worship and to witness, and his worship and his witness confronted culture, and it confronted some false gods that existed in the world there as well. And he was willing to stand in this gap in a hostile place and say, I belong to God. God is the true king. Let's give glory to him because he is the one who is worthy of it. Look at these next few verses in Genesis 12. It says, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site. This is verse six, by the way. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moriah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. So here Abraham is confronting culture with worship and being a witness. He arrives at a specific location, which is Shechem, which is the geographical center of the promised land. And it's here where he's going to start to build God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Now there's a reminder in the text that says at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. And it's a reminder that there was opposition. The Canaanites were a people who were against God's people. They had their own gods. They had their own worship. They were far from God and they wanted to pull others away with them. And the text here in Genesis 12 is reminding us as readers today that Abram stepped into a place where opposition existed in a culture that was gonna push back, in a culture that was gonna fight, in a culture that was gonna try and draw him away. And so because that culture might potentially try and pull him away, he built an altar to say, no, 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 this is the reminder that I belong to God. Some of us, we need to build some altars in our life, not a physical altar, but something that reminds us over and over and over and over again, I belong to God. So when the world starts trying to pull me away, I belong to him. By the way, coming to church on Sunday mornings, this is an altar that we've built into our lives to remind us on the first day of the week, I belong to God. I'm his. And we're reminding ourselves and proclaiming that to the world as well. Abraham stepped into a place of worship and witness. He goes to the tree of Mora, which was a, a place where people would come to speak the future based on the rustling of the leaves. So they'd see the rustling of the leaves and then they would know the future. And people would come because they wanna know the future. We all wanna know the future. We wanna know what the future holds. I wanna know where the stock market's gonna go and which stocks I should buy. But we want security based on our own things rather than based on God. Now, Abraham's building an altar here because he is someone who, he, he gave up control of the future. He said, the future belongs to God. I trust in him. He was willing to leave his security, to leave his wealth, to leave his culture, to leave his identity so that he could pursue what God had in store for him. He said, God, I'm all yours and the future is yours and I'm gonna trust you. I don't need to know the answers because I know you have them. Are you trusting God for the answers? Is your life a, a life of worship? Is it a witness that God has done something in your heart to transform you and change who you are? He continues on and it says he goes and he built a, or he called on the name of the Lord in this next location. And that idea of calling on the name of the Lord is to proclaim the Lord. And here he's doing it not just by himself, but he has his wife, he has his nephew, he has many servants and workers that they've gathered over the years. And when he calls on the name of the Lord, he's saying, we belong to God. This place belongs to God. And we need to do that with our lives as well. To stand up in a culture that's moving further and further away from Christian values, further and further away from celebrating Christ, we need to stand firm and say, my life belongs to the Lord. And we do this in many ways. Showing up to church on a Sunday morning is standing up and saying, with all the other things that I could do with my life, my life belongs to Christ, and I'm gonna give the first day of the week to him. We do this through radical generosity. 
I was saying, my finances are not my own, so why would I try and hold tightly onto them? We do this through radical hospitality, saying Jesus welcomed me in, so I'll welcome others in. We do this by being a people who are quick to forgive, slow to be angry. Listen, if you can do that in our world today, that is a radical witness of Jesus Christ. Because everything is pointing towards be angry, scream louder than the other person to get your way. And we demonstrate Jesus through our love. We need to stand and let our lives be a witness of Jesus Christ. To worship him with everything that we are, everything that we do, and everything that we have. It all belongs to Jesus. And if we can get to that place where we worship him with everything that we have, and we're willing to stand up and be a witness in a culture that might be moving away from Christ, then maybe, just maybe, we'll make a difference in this world. Are you willing to go? Are you willing to forego the things of this world? Are you willing to worship and let your life be a witness? That last song that we sang right before uh, Blake and Caden and our students came up to talk about Citywide, they talked about was the, the theme of Citywide. And after that week, I've just had that song on repeat. Uh, every morning, I start my day off with that song. Because it's just this reminder to me of who we are as a church and what we exist to do and what I exist to do as a follower of Christ. The reminder of the mission, the reminder of the need. That there is a world and a group of people that are lost and broken and dying. And what they need is Jesus. Amen. And we have the answer. We have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And all around us in our homes, in our family, in our places of work, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, all around us there are people who are desperate for Jesus and we know the answer. We know how to give them hope. We know how to give them life. We know the truth. We know how they can experience God's love, not just today, but for all of eternity. But the question that's asked in that song is how can they know unless we go? How can they know unless they are told? Church, are you willing to do the hard work of proclaiming the name of Jesus over and over and over again, day in and day out? Not just to this generation, but to the next and the one after that and the one after that and the one after that until the day Jesus returns again. Are you willing to go and forego the things of this world and live as a witness of Jesus Christ by worshiping him with everything you have and do and say? We need to be a church of mountain movers. So let's put our faith in Jesus and be willing to do what he has called us to do. Abraham was, and he got to be a part of the greatest family line in history. He got to be a part of the line that Jesus came from. And through his family line, there was a blessing to the entire world, the person of Jesus Christ. And for those of us who have put our trust in him, we are now blessed to be a blessing like Abraham to the world around us. And I think God is asking each and every one of us, are you willing Are you willing to trust God? Let's be a church that's willing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that leads us and guides us, that reminds us of who you are. We thank you for these stories of faith from the fathers who came before that help show us how we can live in our world in our time here and now. And so God, I pray that we would be a church that is willing to go where you've called us to go without all the answers, but that we would just trust you. God, that we would be a church that is willing to forego the things of this world, laying them down knowing that you are so much more valuable. God, that we would be a church that worships you with everything that we have and that lives as a witness of you proclaiming your name, proclaiming your word to all we come in contact with. God, let us be a church that makes a difference. 
that build your kingdom here in Carmichael as it is in heaven. Here in our world now today as it is in heaven. God, use us your servants. We are willing to go where you've called us to go. And God, in those moments of unbelief, help us in our unbelief. Remind us of who you are. Remind us of your promises so that we would have a willingness to do what you've called us to do. Increase our faith, Lord. We love you and praise things in Jesus' name. Amen.